how weaponized empathy killed uh, critical thinking. So what is the, 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 effectively what we need to look at is we need to look at this idea of what an ethos is, which is the characteristic spirit of a culture, era, or community as manifested in beliefs, in its beliefs and aspirations, right? So, um, and again, empathy is the primary artistic ethos and cultural currency of our age. Now, Trump, social media, uh, Trumpian rage, is the way that 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 people primarily interact in a, in, in in terms of public discourse, and it's the primary method of public discourse. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to within organizations, within institutions, organizations, and corporations, that we're not dealing with the same way of interacting with people, and that again, empathy has been weaponized, and that is a very bad thing. I lost my best friend. With regard to critical thinking and with regard to um, to uh, effective education, effective organization, right? So if we take a look at a timeline, a, a typical timeline, now I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to use as an example uh, popular music and as a way of trying to understand the ethos of our time. So I'm going to suggest that we move from an ethos coming out of the 1980s of cynicism, which would be exemplified in a way by how much of a cultural phenomenon uh, grunge music was, through to a ethos of sincerity. Imagine you're a hyper-educated avant-garde in grad school learning to write. Right. Okay. Um, screen gets all fuzzy now as the viewers invited to imagine this. That what the really great artists do, and it sounds very trite to say it out loud, well, what the really great artists do is they're entirely themselves. They're entirely themselves. They've got their own vision, their own way of fracturing reality. And that if it's authentic and true, you will feel it in your nerve endings. The new sincerity, the, the courage to live unironically, the courage to live unironically into a kind of condition of empathy. The difference between, in, in, um, the difference between sincerity and empathy being that in, 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 in sincerity, we maintain a kind of emotional distance. We understand we understand another's pain or trauma, but we maintain a kind of intellectual distance from it, where in empathy, we're called on to actually literally feel the same feelings as the other individual. To the current state that I believe that we're in, which is a performative and, empath and, and weaponized empathy, whereby we empathy becomes a defensive tool, and this is really a negative thing. So if we look at the 1990s again, we see it. We see the the, the the early 1990s. We can see, we can make an, an argument that Kurt Cobain, uh, that uh, Nirvana, and that a kind of postmodern ironic grunge ethos was highly cynical, highly critical. Axel Rose walked by us, and, and we yelled at Axel. We said, "Axel, will you be the godfather of our child?" And he said, he stopped. He turned around. Pointed his finger by With his bodyguard. Said. Critical of everything. Everything, everyone was too cool for school. Every, everything was drenched in a kind of cynicism and irony. And then we have David Foster Wallace's seminal essay on the new sincerity. Quote, the next real literary rebels in this country might well emerge as some weird bunch of anti-rebels, born oglers who dare somehow to back away from ironic watching, who have the childish gall actually to endorse and instantiate single entendre principles, who treat of plain old untrendy human troubles and emotions in U.S. life with reverence and conviction, who eschew self-consciousness and hip fatigue. These anti-rebels would be outdated, of course, before they even started, dead on the page, too sincere, clearly repressed, backward, quaint, naive, anachronistic. Maybe that'll be the point. The new sincerity foreshadowed the importance of empathy as a form of cultural currency. So then what we find is that, then we find in kind of educated circles, we find that people start to, to interface with one another in, a ver in very sincere ways, that, that, that we find that our colleagues are listening. And this is a very good thing, quite frankly. It, 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 it's, a, it's a real development for the positive. You know, so the new sincerity as a kind of reaction to uh, postmodern irony, uh, but then it, as we move into 2010, we can take a look at empathy, this idea that, we, that, that we're called on not to, not to be sincere, not to understand the pain and trauma of another or the situation of another, but maintain an intellectual distance from it. But we're actually, 
the ethos moves into a kind of empathetic phase where what we're doing is we're literally called upon to kind of feel the same feelings, the, the same lived experience that other people have and to feel those things. And I would suggest that for at least the past 10 years that within institutions, cultural institutions, within education and within corporations, that empathy is, is the primary cultural currency of our age, but that as we have moved into the 20s, you know, that, that through the development of social media, that weaponized empathy, performative empathy, TikTok, that, that foregrounding our personal trauma and seeing our own narcissistic reflection, reflecting our, our trauma through the lens of social media has weaponized empathy. And what does that mean? That means that foregrounding trauma inoculates the individual from criticism. So if we if we go back to the coming out of the 1980s, there was this cynicism, right? So we find individuals being very cynical and very critical, looking at cultural institutions, looking at capitalism, looking at Western culture with a very cynical uh, cynical gaze. Now within now within again within the institutions because there is such a, an emphasis on expressing one's feelings and, and then uh, people being open to literally feeling those things, it's nearly impossible to disentangle, to, to take apart where, uh, where the person that you're interfacing with, where their, where their feelings begin and end in the issue itself. So bad faith actors, of which there are many, are using performative and weaponized empathy as a way of blunting critical thinking and criticism. Now, if we were to take a, a look at stage theory of artistic movements, we can see that you know there's a formative stage, which we could see as, as um, the new sincerity movement, where in that formative stage, people are, are genuinely attempting to understand these concepts and enact them, right? And then we move into a mature stage, which is sincerity lapses over into empathy. Sincerity becomes even deeper, where, where in a lot of ways, we, we find that in our day-to-day -day interactions, when we discuss, when we are given the green light to discuss our own trauma and discuss our own uh, struggles and, and emotional feelings, that the other is actually called upon to literally feel the things that we're feeling in a public forum. To, um, to the late stage, uh, which we can see becomes, in most late stages of artistic movements, it becomes farce. So we can see here a, a, a kind of classic example of weaponized empathy here, where in TikTok, uh, people are, 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 are constantly performing in a kind of narcissistic mirror their empathy. I mean, their, 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 uh, their emotional state. So I asked ChatGPT to, to um, reconstruct and to rewrite uh, David Foster Wallace's quote uh, uh, from the New Sincerity essay to suggest that weaponized empathy has created a lack of criti criticality in our culture. And let's take a look at that quickly. So here is the original. And here is the ChatGPT rewritten version uh, with a few edits on my part. Perhaps the next true cultural critics will be those who reject weaponized empathy and embrace a critical stance. These rebels would refuse to pander to the prevailing culture of shallow feeling and instead engage with the complexities and contradictions of human experience. They would reject the smug detachment of performative emotion and instead seek to understand the real struggles and emotions of people's lives. They would be dismissed as outmoded and unsophisticated, but their commitment to sincerity and honesty might just make them the true avant-garde. Real cultural critics, it seems, must be willing to risk ridicule and dismissal, to resist the seductive power of sentimentality and to confront the difficult truths of our world without flinching. Also, the last thing that I'd like to show is that uh, in the studio, these are two celebrity portraits. Uh, you could look at them either as celebrity portraits or if you'd like fan art, but this is a portrait of Billie Eilish. And here we have a portrait of Jesse Rutherford. It's a diptych. Uh, last Friday, I did a live stream where I showed the construction of uh, how those were constructed. I'm gonna link to it here.
uh, it is uh, about two hours worth of uh, drawing on the iPad. You can you can take a look at you can take a look at how this uh, this hand, these hand pulled screen prints were constructed. You can also uh, cop them uh, at the link above.